regular meeting, December, last meeting of the year. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. States of America and to the Republic stands nation under God. Okay. First order of business we have uh, Jerry Barron Jr. is absent tonight. I have his proxy. We have uh, Mike Abb, Jerry Hover, uh, Sandy Fosdick, Chan Sims, and uh, Doug McCash are Zooming. Did I miss anybody? No. Okay. The first order we normally have at this time, changes or additions to the agenda, we have none. Uh, celebrating success, I have something that I'd like to say at this time. Uh, I would like to recognize all 400 plus employees of the, the POA, all the way from the part-time summer employees up to and including the COO who is basically on call 24-7. Uh, you have endured unexpected setbacks in 2020 and still found a way to have a very solid financial year in the face of extreme adversity. You have found innovative ways to keep the amenities available to the membership while keeping us all as safe as we are allowing you to do. For this we say thank you we appreciate you. Uh, Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and we look forward to working with you in 2021. To the membership, thank you for adapting to the changes made necessary by this plague. At some point, we will be able to shake hands and see each other smile again. Until then, consider takeout meals, reservations for exercise, and no shotguns for golf as the small price we pay to keep each other safe. A Merry Christmas, happy holidays, stay safe, and see you in 2021. Thank you. Okay, do we have a celebrating success? We do not have a celebrating success. We will move directly then to the approval of the minutes. The first one is November 19th, Regular monthly board meeting. Do I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Mary, motions to approve those minutes? I'll second them. Dave Welch will seconds. Are there any questions? Hearing none, I will call for the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye or raise your hands. Aye. 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 I believe it is unanimous. The next minutes, December 10th work session. Who wants to make a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Tia makes the motion. The second? Second. Mary will second that. Are there any questions there? No questions, we will move to the vote. All those in favor of approving those minutes, signify by saying aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Unanimous. Next up, joint advisory committee reports. Lakes. We don't have anybody from the Lakes. Nobody from Lakes here. Lakes, uh, we encourage you to read through the minutes of the Lakes Committee meeting, uh, but they did spend quite a bit of time uh, discussing, kind of doing a recap of what has been accomplished by the committee over the last two years, uh, the number of changes that they have made to the uh, boating regulations to improve safety for our property owners. 
So I encourage you to go read through that. Uh, they've actually uh, accomplished quite a bit. Uh, and on behalf of the board, uh, I thank them for their efforts over the last two years. Yes, they put a lot of work into that, and uh, I feel that I feel that they've they've got a reasonable solution. Uh, next up, recreation uh, had no meeting in December, and golf had no meeting in December. So I'm guessing we're not going to have a report. Next up is financial reports, and we've always got financial reports. Stacy? <laughs> All right, can you hear me? Oops, sorry, it took me. I'm gonna step out of the way here so I can pull my mask down. So, um, mixed it up a little bit this month, coming into year end. We wanted to talk about November, and we'll talk about year to date as well. So we're gonna start out with the POA on November. And remember the financial reports are in the presentation, will be on the website. Um, we will also add the additional financials we normally do, but with the board meeting being a week early, those are gonna to have to follow. So they'll be out there later. So let's talk about November. So November, as we, we um, told you last month that our expenses would be going up, if you see in the top left-hand box, our revenue, our cost of goods sold, and our gross profit, are all well above budget for the month. Uh, revenue, we came in at 1.6 versus a budget of 1.4. Cost of goods sold was 82 versus a budget of 87. Our gross profit came in at 1.48 versus the budget of 1.28. And then our operating expenses were over. They came in at 1.6 versus a budget of 1.3. And our EBITDA then, because of the expenses, came in at a negative 112 versus a budget of a negative six. So uh, operating and EBITDA were both off a little bit for November as expected. If you look at the box right below that, you can see the operating expenses. So just to kind of reiterate what we've talked about, you can see the first part of the year where our expenses were lower, we held back as we went into COVID and all of the challenges. And now as we've come out towards the end of the year and our revenue is looking good, um, we're catching up on some of those expenses. So I really think we're gonna see December look very similar to November if the weather holds. I think our revenue, our costs, and our profits gonna be good, and I think we may have some challenges in our expenses as we finish out the year. Uh, if you move over to the right and you look at the EBITDA slide, that is very similar to what we just talked about, but you can see in the red line where our 2020 actual EBITDA is just slightly below budget, but still well above uh, last year. So um, having a good year, and we'll talk about that here in a second. The box at the bottom, and those are just some of the key callouts. So from a revenue standpoint, our golf was up 99,000, cart rentals were 24, and green fees were 66. The RV park had a really good November. Um, they were up 15,000, sold out Thanksgiving. Our lot sales were up 59,000. They had a judicial sale, and they also had 8,000 in online sales. Our legal fees were up 20,000. Doug had a multi-lot judgment he's working on there. And then of course FMB still has its COVID challenges and they were down 18 at Lake Point and 11 at Bar and Grill. And that's on the revenue. On expenses, same story that we talked about last month, salaries and employee benefits are up 43,000. Hourly wages are up 21 and our health is up 18. And then we're down um, because of our expenses being up in several areas. Some of those being equipment and tools are at 84,000 for the month. Uh, 34,000 of that was in Cisco routers and firewalls that were obsolete, we had to update. Maintenance and repairs were down 58. 10,000 of that was in water heaters for the Branchwood area. Supplies were off by 35. We had 15 in fishery catch-up, 5,000 in pro shop fixtures, and some easy picker discs. And professional services is off because of stump dump. So that's just some of the bigger expenses that we saw come through for November. Uh, if you move to the top, in the top left-hand box, we talked about Thanksgiving. I think this was an idea of somebody on the board, and it was a great idea. But the Thanksgiving Day meal, um, Lake Point had pre-orders of 189 meals, and then Lake Point Restaurant had 163 meals. Uh, Lake Point revenue was 7,500 for the day, and then last year they were at 6,800. And then the bar and grill had 190 meals that day at $4,400 versus 2,400 last year. So they had a very strong Thanksgiving. Um, and then the other box I have up there is just kind of a keep an eye on this prepaid assessment. So in 2020, 
or in 2019, we had 14,805 accounts with a prepaid balance of 390,000 at the end of November. If you look at December, it's a little misleading for 2020 because we have 14,656 accounts. Even though the dollars are more, we had an assessment increase. So we're seeing about 150 accounts less that are prepaying, which is part of our cash issue this year um, or this month. So we don't know if that is just a combination of people prepaid at the beginning of 2019 and their prepayment ran out early because of the assessment change and they're probably holding out and gonna catch up again in January? Or is there a trend changing? Is there a COVID issue? We don't really know, but something we're kind of keeping our eye on and we'll have more information going into January as to kind of what's going on with prepaids. So talk about the loan. So our intercompany water loan, uh, as projected, we had to borrow in November. We borrowed 456,000. Part of this is due to the prepaids, part of it's the expense, and part of it's receivables that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, I still project we're going to end about 2.75. Um, again, some of that's going to be weather. Some of that's what happens with prepaids and receivables as we go into the end of the year. So a lot of moving factors there. But again, if you remember, we started at 3.5 at the beginning of the year. Our goal was to be at 3.2 at the end of the year, so we'll still end well below what our goal was for the year. Okay, so November receivables and the cash dashboard. I want to talk about this as just kind of an, an education, I guess. Um, if you look at the top left-hand corner, or let's look at the bottom left-hand corner first, the accounts receivable aging boxes. You can see our collections team is doing a good job of kind of keeping us current year over year. But then when you go into the buckets of the 60 to 180, 180 to 365, and over 365, you can see how we're increasing each one of those um, this year compared to last year. A lot of that's COVID, a lot of that's in payments and other things, and a lot of it's just delayed payments. Also, with assessments going up, your receivables go up. So if you have the same number of people, it's just you have more receivables. The issue with it is, if you look at the bad debt expense on the right, you can see September, October, November, our bad debt expense is climbing. So as we move into the 61 to 365 day buckets, we have to start writing off part of our receivables as not being collectible. So we're saying as it ages, we don't have as much that we can collect. So as we move into 2021, my concern is that we could continue to see some of these receivables go up and our bad debt go up and our cash come down because of that. Um, one of the things we're doing, we've talked about this a little bit before, is we have a project going on called the over 365 bucket, which is the big bucket. Um, accounting's working with legal and we've got 2,600 member accounts in that bucket right now. We've reached out to 325 of those just in November. And of the 325, we had a 6% return rate for bad addresses that were having to work. But we did have 12 payments or $9,500 in a couple week period there. We had four or five payment plans, and we now have 17 people that have, are working with legal to see about relinquishing their lots back to legal so that they can resell them. So there is some wins in that as well, but it's gonna be a big project that will keep going um, over the course of the next year. Um, what's that? We've only been able to reach out so far to 325. We've got a whole list of them. Some of them we haven't heard back from, so we're gonna have to go to the next step of going to either outside collections. We're gonna make some phone calls first, see if we can get some payment plans, and we just kind of have a progression, and this is just who we've heard from, and so we'll just keep moving through it. Did you have a question? If you don't mind, do we know what percentage of those are resident and non-resident? Most of them, oh, resident, non-resident, no, but I can get that for you. That but most of them are lots, you know, it's so. Like somebody somewhere else I'm around the lots. Yeah. Lots, yeah. And there's a lot of multi-lots in there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think all of them pretty much are unimproved lots. Okay. Thank you. And so, and so there's probably a good portion of those that are non-residents. It would be for somebody else is already on that. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So anyway, just kind of an eye-opener of what we got going on. I think it's kind of a, a late bloomer to the COVID issue that we have uh, possibly, but we'll be watching that next year. And then of course you ask, okay, so expenses are up, receivables are up, what's our cash looking like? So the top corner or top box you'll see that red line is our 2020 cash and it's continued to climb, no cash issues. Uh, October we were sitting at 5 million, November we're at 3.8 million and that's consolidated. Uh, we did make the extra million dollar bond payment and that's what brought us down in November. And so we will see that go out the door. It's actually in our bank account and we make the payment in January. So that's kind of our receivables. It's just kind of an eye-opener. Just want to make you aware of what's going on. 
All right, so POA year-to-date numbers. Uh, a lot of the same story we've seen before. Uh, our revenue is looking great. We're at 18 million versus the 18 million, 18,245 versus 18,082. Our variance is 163,000. Cost of goods sold, a variance of 128,000. Labor, um, I broke that out because there's always a little bit of talk about that, but our, our labor is um, to the good of 513,000. Our expenses are to the good of 586. And of course, EBITDA, which is the bottom line and the big number, we're at a positive 878. So all of those are highlighted in yellow. All of them are positive. We're hitting on all of our numbers coming into year end. So it, it's a great year. Um, if you look to the right, I just did some call outs and some key ones. Revenue impact. The golf greens are up 343,000, golf overall, um, and we're down on the KFSM line for our uh, revenue. Our boat registration fees are up 57,000, our motor boat rentals are up 56, RV storage fees are up 29, our RV park, full service is up 23, and overall the RV income's up 49. Again, same story for the month, uh, food and beverage is down 352. Facility use is down 74. All of this is with restrictions for COVID in those areas. On the expense side, our total salaries and wages are up, or excuse me, are better than budget by 513,000. Employee benefits are better by 244. Membership training and travel is better than 50, and our utilities are better by 107. Some of the areas were over, kind of the same as always. Professional services, the stump dump is 229 of it. Equipment and tools, again, we had the Cisco routers and firewalls that we talked about a minute ago. Maintenance and repairs, we had an irrigation and pump replacement earlier this year. And then, uh, again, another call out that we do anticipate additional expenses in December. Um, our payables sitting on the books are still high, and I think some of those will get paid out in December as we close out invoices and projects. So one thing that we added to talk about tonight is um, capital and where are we at coming into the end of the year. So 2020 capital updates. Um, our pickleball courts. So I know Joan's on, so she may have extra she wants to add to this. Um, the fencing has been removed and all the design planning and court layout has been begun. And the contractor and weather has kind of delayed it a little bit, but she's on it and I know that they're moving forward with it. The country club roof, it's completed and we're waiting on insurance to finalize that. Um, the Metfield parking lot is complete and we're finalizing that. And then the Great Plains upgrade, that's accounting software. Um, and then we've delayed that just until after year end close that we don't want to try to do them both at the same time. 2020 other projects, we have a couple of those uh, we have going on that were really, um, we got the money from the grant and we're gonna talk about the grant in January, but we've used some of the money for these projects. The dog park, one of those, and where the clearing is done and the fencing is supposed to start next week. Um, and miniature golf, the carpet's received, the bridges are been painted, and the features will be delivered by the end of the year. So those are moving forward nicely as well. Um, the last chart I have on here is to the left. And can you go back, Tom? <laughs> oh, OK. So anyway. Um, so I worked with the guys and they went out and got me some pictures and so the Highlands Clubhouse just it's a deck project they have going on out there right now. Um, thought it'd be fun to share some pictures and that's what the deck is looking like. It's done and it's been added onto the Highlands Clubhouse. And then here's the Scottsdale deck expansion and so it's not done yet but they have the flooring down and I saw another picture today they got the railings up and it's looking good too so nice. we'll see a final one uh, in January. So can you go back two slides? Real quick, um, I did want to call out the 2020 year-to-date gross profit by revenue stream. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I know we talk a lot about general income, golf ops, food and beverage, recreation, and I just want to make sure as we go into the end of the year that we're also recognizing that there's a lot of other areas that kind of make up the whole pie for all the revenue at the POA. And so you can kind of see it's smaller pieces of it, but you know we have the legal, we have lakes and parks, the advertising income, collections, maintenance and construction. So there's several other pieces in there that don't get talked about a lot, so I just wanted to make sure from an education standpoint for the membership, they see all the pieces of the income that we have going on. Okay, now you can flip through. Okay, water. Um, so moving into water for November. And again, our financials are on the website, so feel free to go out and see those, and we'll have additional financials out there when they're complete. So water for the month of November um, had a good revenue. 
Our actuals came in at 759 versus a budget of 715. Our cost of goods sold, our actual was 187 versus budgeted 200. Our gross profit was 572 versus a budget of 515. Uh, operating expense, same story as the POA. Actual was 362 versus a budgeted 234. Project catch up, you can see it down in the bottom chart as well. Same trend as what we have with the POA. And our EBITDA mm -hmm. actual was 210 versus a budget of 280. So off a little bit on expenses and EBITDA, but you'll see again, we're having a strong year when we get there. Uh, on the right hand side, the EBITDA charts the same as the POA. You can see where our EBITDA for the year for 2020 mm -hmm. actual is over the 2019. It's a little under for 2020, but it's still, um, it's solid throughout the year. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do for charts next year because it won't be as pretty in January. Um, and then at the bottom, you can see the revenue and the expenses. So revenue, water sales are up 23, and capital buy-in fees are up 37 for November. Our expenses, fuel and oil, were under budget by uh, 1,000 bucks, and employee benefits by four. And then some of the areas that they were over, supplies, 102, we had water meters and parts. Of course, water sales are up, so expenses are up. Equipment and tools, uh, they had some chop saws and other supplies that they needed and maintenance and repairs. They needed the pump and repair parts as well. So a couple statistics that Charlie gave me I thought were interesting. Gallons sold through November in 2020, we had 381, and in 2019, we had 328. And if you look at the top, um, new water service through November of 19, we had 191, and through November of 2020, we're at 365. And then leaks repaired through November of 19, we had 328 and through November of 2020, we have 381. So the water department's busy. Okay, so let's talk year to date for water. So year to date, um, revenue, they're over by 1.21 million. Um, cost of goods is good by 50,000. Labor, they're good by 15. Expenses are a little bit over by 279, but when you look at revenue and what they're doing, it's, you know, it's expected. And our EBITDA is up by 981,000, so almost a million dollars. So um, having an outstanding year. The gross profit, we talked a little bit about this, so I thought it'd be kind of a neat picture to look at. But if you look at the gross profit on the bottom, you can see where the gross profit was for 2019, and then uh, the top line is 2020. So the gross profit's consistently been higher in 2020, running you know in the 70s um, this year versus in the 60s last year. So. Big difference. Uh, revenue impact. So, water sales are up 537,000. New connections, 348. Water capital buy-in fees, 408. And then gain and loss on surplus are 41. Those are the big ones. Uh, some of the things they're under is intercompany sales. Of course, the POA's utilities are doing good, so their intercompany water is is off. Uh, water late fees are down and miscellaneous. Um, and then on the expense side, their sales and wages are up by 15, or better than budget by 15. Employee benefits are better by 46. Membership training and travel by eight, and fuel and oil by 15. Some of the areas they're over, which is expected, is supplies, 231,000 water installation equipment. Equipment and tools, uh, power tools and chop saws we talked about, and maintenance and repairs, some large pumps and added repair parts. So some of the same stuff that we, we talked about. Um, and then capital updates. So we don't have a lot of capital right now in water. Most is closed for the year. But the Highway 340, Sugar Creek relocation, uh, construction started, completion dates pending, and I think it's the early January is what I heard. And then the Highway 340, BPS electrical renovation has not been started. All right, so let's talk a little bit about EBITDA. This is a slide that we've looked at before. Um, as you can see, we're, we've got more departments that are behind on EBITDA. Um, general income, food and beverage, IT, clubhouses, membership, accounting, and communication and marketing. And then you can see the other ones that um, are well above EBITDA. So, but as a department, water is up by 982, and the POA is up by 878. So consolidated, we're over by 1.9 million. So the last thing I wanted to end on a holiday note, and I just wanted to make sure everybody remembered that Lake Point is having their Christmas dinner pickup. Pre-order meals by December 18th. Pickup at Lake Point December 23rd from 3 to 7. 
Don't ask me questions about the menu. That's a Tommy question, but it's roasted turkey <laughs> and ham, garlic, green beans with red pepper, um, truffle infused with potatoes, and then of course a dessert. So um, the phone number's on there, and if you haven't ordered, then make sure you do because it will be an outstanding meal. So that's the financials for November. Um, any questions? I have a question about the, when you were talking about it just being POA, the first couple slides, right before that we talked about a water loan, because November and December we know we have to, we're going right. to, but then the next slide says we're hitting all of our metrics. So as I'm thinking as a member, I understand that because I look through the, all of the documents, right, but right. as a member, how do you help explain that where we can still be doing so great, even though we just said we're borrowing from water, it seems contradictory, but right so how do we help from that? a year to date perspective then we are we are doing let me see how i can explain this we are doing great if you want to jump in tom feel free um because we're hitting sales and revenue we're hitting cost we're hitting expenses and bottom line but from a cash perspective because we have cash going out the door that's a balance sheet impact and so you know p and l and balance sheet are two separate mm -hmm pieces and so I guess when you look at the cash you have in the bank compared to what you have going on from a P&L perspective. So okay. also think of it this way, we bring in a large amount of uh, cash early on in the year uh, from the assessments and then because a lot of people prepay and then we, th then we also have a lot of people that pay monthly and then during the summertime we bring in a tremendous amount of money from golf and all the other amenities but during the winter time during November, we have very limited revenue, but we have still a lot of expenses because we have to operate the place. So that's why we tend to be very cyclical with our cash flow because there's certain times during the year where our revenue is very high, summertime, a lot of golfers, a lot of people at Blowing Springs, um, and then there's certain times during the year where it's the opposite of that. And that's what November is. So we're, we're doing very well. And so that's why Stacy was pointing out, we started, our loan was started at 3.5. Our yeah, target was 3.2. And we're actually going to be about 2728 when we're all done. So we're actually going to beat our goal by half a million dollars. That's really outstanding. Would it be safe to say that with the history of the past couple of years and what we have to borrow in November, December, we're borrowing less and kind of getting on a, a track where maybe eventually we won't have to be that cyclical? We could not depend on water? Well, I think we're always going to... Far think, future. I think that, well, first of all, it's hard to compare to 19 simply because you have the Trafalgar fire expenses dramatically impact, impacting 19. Um, I think we're always going to have, our cash flow is always going to be cyclical. Now our goal is to steadily decrease the amount of loan and we've done that in the 21 budget. Um, but still within that decrease, we're going to have a cyclical nature. You know, there, you can't bring a lot of, you can't get a lot of people to play golf in November. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and you don't want to go to people and say, no, don't pay us your assessments in January. Hold on to them all the way till November. You don't want to do that either. Uh, you want them to pay in advance and pay on time. And so um, it, it, we're always going to be cyclical in nature. Most businesses are. Uh, but our goal is to, is to constantly bring that loan balance down. And that's also why Stacy's focusing on year end because of the cyclical nature to compare one month to another month within a year is really challenging, but to compare year end to year end, that's, that's a fair apples to apples comparison. Then Stacy, I guess my question would be to you with what you've learned about our finances. Do you think we're ever going to get to a point where we can have enough cash to sustain the POA side without water borrowing? Um, yeah, I absolutely. I think we can. I mean, if you look at what we paid back uh, yeah. just this year, you know, I think that there's definitely an opportunity. We were there at one point, and I think we'll get back there. I mean, it's been a great revenue year. You know, I think if you look at your financials and level them out, you'll see that, you know, the borrowing, like Tom said, is very cyclical. We waited on expenses until the end of the year. We were smart. We didn't know what COVID was going to do or anything else. And yeah. so we've held and held and held. And so, but I think if you look at it from a flat perspective, absolutely. Okay. So, I mean, I think it might take a couple of years, but I, you know, I think it's, I think we're definitely on the right track. 
Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other do questions? I, I have do I dare make too. a comment, Tia? Uh, I don't really care. We own the water company. I know. And, and I know that's kind of one of those things we've talked about. We own the water company. Who cares if we borrow money from them? When we borrow money from them, we pay them back at prime or some function or uh, factor of prime. So we own the water company. I really don't care because what we're doing is providing amenities to our people and our residents. Sure, I'd love to see us not have to do that, but I don't care. We own the water company. And if we have to borrow money from them, all, so be it. And that's just the way we, well, that's just the way we do business. And again, I don't care. I mean, that's opening a can of worms that people don't like to hear, but I don't really care about that. We own the water company. And if we need the money, we borrow it from them. We pay them back. And we're paying ourselves interest. So we're making money from our own loans. Does that make any sense? It really does. It really does. I do understand so, it completely. It's mm -hmm. just kind of like, do you want to put your Christmas on a credit card or do you want to save it from January monthly to that's not the, have to put it on a credit card? That's the American card. way. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and I think what we want you to focus on also on is, and, and you'll see this, that Stacy gave a very balanced report. I mean, when she's talking about receivables, that's not great news, but it's expected given COVID. Yeah. Um, uh, but on the positive side, both the POA and the water are having a very good, strong financial year. Now, she's given us multiple warnings. December, our expenses are going to be up because we're racing to try and catch up those projects that we delayed earlier in the year. Mm -hmm. And we're, you know, so we're going to be over on expenses in, in <clears throat> December. We know that. Um, but uh, as a whole, we've had a, a, a tremendous year and comparing, compared to a lot of businesses that are really struggling, um, we're very fortunate and we've been able to uh, get those projects that we deferred, get them done, as opposed to not doing them at all, which would have been really unfortunate. Yeah, and I don't mean for my questions to sound like I'm complaining or no, I'm just, I'm no. forward looking years. I, I cannot say enough about how great the departments have done with our budget and finances this year. It's been amazing to see what 2020, this is not where I thought we'd be if you had asked me in April. So uh, it's, it's amazing. I, I, we cut out so much from the budget because we fully anticipated it would be a tough year. Um, it's turned out to be quite a bit better of the year than we thought, uh, but we cut out a ton of, uh, from the budget. Uh, now, the, the good news is we were able to cut a ton out. The bad news is you can see it. <laughs> you can put see it back it. someday. Um, yeah. uh, and that's why we're scrambling to get get those things caught up before the end of the year so that you don't see it. The uh, one item that I'd like to comment on that I've been keeping an eye on is the uh, assessments that are not coming in and what we're doing to pursue that the efforts that are being made to get our membership uh, up to date, continue to bring down the numbers uh, of non-paying lots. And uh, there are, as Stacy mentioned, there are a number of ongoing efforts and I'm watching that closely to see how that works out, particularly because of the COVID situation, but just in general because we don't want to have uh, people owning lots who do not want to be members. If they don't want the lot, we do. We have people standing in line who want to buy lots. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll take those lots gladly. So we're trying to reach out to them. She says some of them, you, we, we don't have current addresses that's a problem and it's hard to resolve but when we can make contact with people we can work with them so that's yeah. what i'm keeping an eye on and all those numbers that are cyclical uh, i come from a farming background i understand cash flow and you know lean and you know boom and bust so it doesn't bother me at all that we borrow money one time of the year and another time of the year there's money coming out our ears it's just a part of life. So that being said, <laughs> let's, let's move on. We'll I just never get out of here. One quick comment to Tia is I wasn't part of this, you know, management team at the beginning of the year when all the decisions were made, 
but from a financial perspective, they made the right decisions, not knowing what was going to happen this year. And mm -hmm. so by holding back on those expenses and by cutting back and not knowing, they did the right thing for the membership. And you know now they're trying to do the right thing for the membership and, and catch up on some of that. But you know you do see some big swings, but it, it absolutely was the right decision this year. Good. And I want to remind people that uh, Stacy in her budget for 21 has increased her collection staff because we're seeing the writing on the wall and we would rather get those additional bodies in there, get them working to keep that number under control as opposed to let the number get under control, out of control and then trying to catch up. It, it gets so much harder. You, you, you know, it's much easier to get some person to, to get current when they're $200 behind, but when they're six or $700 behind, it's so impossible to get them to get current. So uh, we're hitting them early, and, uh, and that's why we're sending out so many letters on our Project 365. That's really exciting. And one, one other interesting thing that we saw with the collections, some of the payment plan plans that we have right now due to COVID, not related to the 365, but people who were paying and are now for whatever reason can't. Um, one of the interesting things that we've, we've come to realize is if we tell them, you know what, just start paying your $37 now. Don't worry about all these months when you weren't working. Let's just start now so you don't fall further behind, and then we'll get a payment plan after the first of the year on what's missing. So, you know, it's kind of an interesting dynamic, but it's really worked, yeah. and I think people are kind of feeling relieved from that. So, um, so hopefully we'll have some catch up there as well. Next item on the agenda. Thank you. Is the open forum. Can I ask the question forum. first? Comment. Dan. I was wondering, the, the people that are paying the annual assessments and the annual golf and carts, are they, um, is that income being recorded in a prepaid and then recorded monthly? So Rather than recorded in the month in which it comes in? No, if they pay for an entire year, like in November or December, that is actually deferred revenue and it's carried into next year. And if they're making payments, we recognize that revenue as, as they actually use that revenue, I guess, is the way to, to explain that. I, I couldn't understand you. Uh, we follow the accrual basis of accounting. So if you prepay in uh, December, let's say you prepay your assessments or you prepay your annual golf membership, uh, we are going to start recognizing that revenue when we earn it in 21. We don't recognize that revenue, that prepaid revenue. It's a prepaid, it's not revenue in December. Carried as a liability. That makes sense? Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's the way it should be done. I just wanted to be sure. <laughs> yep, yep. The cruel basis of counting. Choice. We don't have any choice on that one, do we? <laughs> no. Okay, I believe Tammy has a letter, uh, an email to be read. Yes, I do, David. It's from Jack Bartlett. Board of Directors, at the open forum portion of the November 19th, 2020 Board of Directors meeting, a letter was read that brought to the attention of the board that Chairman Brandenburg, speaking for the board regarding the removal of McKee, has violated the ex post facto retroactive provisions of the U.S. Constitution. Brandenburg's action is equivalent to backdating the effective date of the revision to Article 3 to May 14, 2020, the date of McKee's removal. And all directors know, or should know, this, could, this would be clearly illegal. After the letter was read, Brandenburg asked Judson if he had a response. He stated that he did, and a portion of the response follows. So first of all, the U.S. Constitution governs, governs federal law and actions taken by the government officials. It does not govern, govern the policies and procedures of a private entity such as the POA. And as a result, Mr. Bartlett's concerns that the POA is violating the U.S. Constitution's ex post facto laws are unfounded. The POA is not violating the U.S. Constitution. Judson's position that all policies and procedures of the POA are exempt from the articles of the U.S. Constitution, which includes the Bill of Rights, is totally absurd. The Constitution of the United States is the supreme law of the United States of America and contains the responsibilities that the government has in order to protect the rights of its citizens. And the Constitution protects all citizens from ex post facto laws. 
Having the COO of the BVPOA believe that any private entity is exempt from the Articles of the Constitution is ridiculous and having the majority of the members of the board believing that the POA is exempt from constitutional requirements is even more ridiculous. Would the directors that believe the POA is exempt, repeat exempt as in not subject to, from the provision, provisions of the Constitution so indicate by verbal consent? Since this letter addresses the board of directors that vote, would the chairman of the board who votes provide a response that recommends a course of action for resolution? Thanks for any consideration, Jack Bartlett. Over the last three months, Mr. Bartlett has sent multiple emails and letters to the board rehashing effectively the same issue. His emails and letters have been addressed by the board repeatedly and his questions answered thoroughly and completely. If Mr. Bartlett remains unclear on any issue, I encourage him to reread the numerous responses which have been provided to him. I do not feel any further response is necessary. No one signed up to speak to the board tonight in open forum, so we will move on to the next item, which is a request waiver request for the three bid requirement this has to do <coughs> excuse me this has to do with a project for the Kingsdale pool Tom you want to explain so uh, one of the projects approved for the 21 capital budget is the uh, uh, renovation work of the decking and so forth at uh, Kingsdale pool uh, we have a budget of one hundred and thirty two thousand uh, dollars and we've talked about similar challenges before where we try and get as and get three bids and we struggle to get three bids uh, we contacted five companies uh, two submitted bids uh, one for one hundred and eighty eighty two thousand dollars and another one for one hundred and thirty two thousand dollars the other three companies were unwilling to bid they felt it was out of their scope of expertise uh, so we are asking uh, that the board approve uh, that and allow management to move forward even though we only have two bids uh, and we are selecting the lower of the two bids uh, let me jump in here a minute Tom we have a golf project that's ongoing right now and we're having a similar issue uh, and I've twisted the arms of a couple of golf contractors to try to get them to bid our project, uh, our T projects at, at, at uh, Highlands and the Country Club. So I understand exactly where you're coming from and this issue is the same. So I will make a motion to grant a waiver for the three bid policy for the Kingsdale pool renovation project. While five companies were asked to submit a bid and only two companies ended up submitting a bid, management is recommending we select the lower of the two bids submitted. Is there a second? Second. T a seconds? Is there any discussion on this? Seeing none, I will ask for a vote. All those in favor signify by raising your hand or saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Move on to the next item. Do you mind if I jump in? You want Go me right to ahead. Okay. If you turn to uh, page 18 of your board packet, uh, you'll see that we are recommending a change to uh, bylaw article five, section two. Uh, and this is on page, is that page 21, 20? Uh, we're recommending that, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the Rules and Regulations Committee is recommending uh, that we add a provision, uh, and it is as follows. As a result of vacancies on the board, see bylaws Article 3, Section 6, there may be instances where more than three vacancies must be filled in one election. In that case, the three candidates who receive the most votes will each be deemed elected to a three-year term. For each additional vacancy, the candidates with the next highest number of votes will be deemed to elected to serve the term of the vacancy with the most outstanding time remaining. This, is, this change is consistent with how we have handled it previously several years ago, if memory serves me correctly, uh, Mr. Director Lowry came in fourth place and uh, served a one-year term. Um, 
And so uh, we felt it was best to get this documented in our bylaws. Any questions? Okay, do I hear a motion? Well, I make a motion to approve the changes to bylaws article 5 section 2 as noted. This is the first of two required readings. Is there a second? Second. Mary makes a second. Okay, now open for discussion. Just want to remind, I mean, this was said in the last meeting and at Rules and Regs, but um, just as chair of Rules and Regs, I'd like to remind the members that this is in no way affecting anything other than the election. It has nothing to do with removing a member or board member. It has nothing to do with any other situations or who can run or anything like that. This is simply just to put into policy something that has been common practice that was just not written down. That, that is, is all. correct. Hearing no further discussion, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor signify by raising your hand or saying aye. Aye. And nobody opposed? It's passed unanimously. Next up we have on page 21 of your board packet, we have uh, a discussion about uh, proposed trail enhancements and the tra proposed transfer of land to the POA. I have a short presentation to uh, share with the membership. This is consistent with the presentation that was given last week at the work session. Uh, so we have two items on this agenda. Uh, the proposed improvements to the back 40 and proposed transfer of land from the trailblazers to the POA. I, as I indicated last week, uh, it's actually uh, the two parcels are under different legal names, but they're by and large controlled by the trailblazers. So for, so for simplicity purposes, we're going to refer to it as the trailblazers. Um, the first one is on the back 40. So what they're proposing is, uh, is improvements in these two particular areas. Uh, what they've done is they've, they've learned two things since the trails were open on the back 40 in 2016. First off is the this section to the left, which is now in the blue and the yellow. Uh, that area is not being used quite as much and they feel that they need to come in, add an additional trail that is very close to the existing one to make improvements to increase the usage. Uh, they have uh, uh, trail counters throughout our system and they're able to track how much usage certain areas are getting uh, used how much trails are getting used and they found that this one particular area is just not getting used enough. Um, so they went back in, they did an analysis, why, is, why are uh, uh, mountain bikers and why are hikers not using this area and what can we do to improve it uh, so they will start using that. So uh, what I particularly like about this is that even though the trails were completed and handed over in 2016, Trailblazers are coming back years later and going, how do we make this better? Um, you know, we can't assume that we're going to get it perfect on the first try, and how do we take it to the next level? The next change here is I'm going to have you look at the upper section, upper right section of the circled area. You'll see a yellow uh, trail in, uh, added there. And what they've learned in this instance is that having smaller looping areas um, works really well for mountain bikers and, ha and hikers. Having really large loops may work for some people, but uh, most people want a little bit smaller loop. And notice that this is really combines the two areas. Uh, they're both interconnected because what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to go up through the connector and then down through the flow ride and so forth and you will treat this as an entire loop. So um, while they're two different sections, it's really they're, they're combined. Uh, they're, it's kind of a package deal if you want to call it that. In addition to the improvements on the back 40, uh, they're proposing that they gift, deed over to the POA, two parcels of land. 
Uh, the first one on this map is in the upper section in purple, and is, I'm referring to it as Arkmo South. The second one, which I'll cover second, is Huntley, and it's right next to our current member services or our water department. So we'll cover Arkmo South first. So if you recall, uh, last year the POA sold all of Arkmo, uh, which was 366 acres. Uh, this is actually just 33 acres, and you can see that there's already trails on that area. Uh, I've walked this area many times. It's a really good trail area. So they're, they're um, proposing that they uh, grant that over to us, the POA. The second section is here is Huntley, and you see to the left, there's the water department. You can even see the water tower right there, and you'll see that uh, they've purchased these uh, 33 acres. It might actually be a little bit less than that. It might be like 29 acres that they transfer over to us, but you'll notice how the trails go in and out of the, the purple area. Uh, they go onto common property, they go back in and so forth. So one thing I want to be make sure that I make clear of is if you look were to look at the hundred miles of soft surface trails that we have, approximately 98% of all those trails are on common property. Um, the city also has some areas that are uh, some of the trails are on city land and so forth. But whether whether the trails are um, on POA property or not the trails maintenance agreement that we entered into, we still have to maintain it. Um, but this gives us further control over this land. And what I think is, is particularly interesting about this is over time we've been trying to monetize the benefits of having the trails. Um, I provided a report to the board. It showed that in 2015, before the back 40 opened, we brought in about $70,000 net on the bottom line uh, at Blowing Springs, and that number is now $180,000. And a lot of that you can attribute to the use of the trails, uh, particularly down at Blowing Springs where you have the RVers and the campers and so forth, the tiny cabin that we have. Um, what we're trying to do in other areas is how do we further monetize it? How do we further get the benefit of these trails? Can we add additional camping areas? Could we add pavilions and rent the pavilions? Could we add concession stands? Um, those types of things to further monetize the trails. So not only are they a fantastic amenity, but they're also bringing in revenue and that would be a really good thing. Uh, this particular piece of property, um, uh, the Huntley property, uh, the 33 acres was uh, purchased a couple of years ago uh, for $353,000. They would be deeding it to the POA um, for free. While we would, uh, so I, I want to go back and emphasize that while there's additional trails that would be owned by the POA as opposed to maintained, the the amount of money that we have allocated and are contractually required to spend on maintenance would not change. So let me look at this a couple additional points. Um, if the board approves the new trails on the back 40, an amendment would have to be made to the licensing trails while licensing agreement. It would have to be made by the POA and the city the city would have to vote on it in a public forum, in a public setting. Uh, I've had a conversation with the mayor. He indicated uh, that uh, he felt it would go, uh, go well. Of course, he can't speak for the entire city council. Um, uh, with regards to the trails on Arkmo South and Huntley, once construction has been finalized, we're still going to be spending that $35,000. I tried to emphasize that point just a little bit ago. So it does not increase that $35,000 obligation that we already have. The city also has a similar $35,000 uh, obligation. It does not increase theirs either. Um, if the board were to approve uh, the acceptance of the two parcels, um, we would also want to go to Cooper and have them authorize it, those, those parcels to become common property. Um, there's certain protections in, uh, when it's common property. 
Uh, you, we can only sell common property with a vote of uh, the membership. Um, also, when it's common property, we can then uh, add water and uh, the trailblazers would like to add water to Huntley and other locations. Uh, I've had a preliminary conversation with Cooper regarding uh, uh, allowing these two parcels to be common property and, and it's been a favorable conversation. Um, I mentioned about the uh, drinking water they would like to add at Huntley. We can only do that uh, if it's common property. Uh, and finally, uh, we've talked about uh, how this will not increase costs for the POA. And I want to remind people of the uh, 2020 commitment uh, that was made and quote, aside from current maintenance commitments, uh, no additional commitment of POA funds will be considered for the expansion of trails until at least 2023. So that was straight from the 2020 plan brochure. And you see that uh, uh, this arrangement that is being proposed does not violate the commitment that the board made to the community. Questions? Okay. First, I need a motion. Get a motion on the floor. So I have a motion for the licensing agreement. Who will make that motion? I move that we approve the third amendment to the limited terminable license agreement with the understanding there will be no increase in cost to the POA for a period of at least three years. The city of Bella Vista will also have to approve this amendment. Is there a second? I'll second it. David Welch will second. Okay, now is there discussion on this? I'll, I'll pipe up here. I'm a fan of the trails. I'm a fan of refining the product. I'm a fan of reclaiming sold property and, and getting it gifted back to us. I think it's benefits all the way around. I know we can find ways to make it sound like, I guess this is a violation of more trails being built. I don't think so. I think this is a refinement of the product and I, and I feel like it'll be a benefit to that neighborhood and a benefit to the trail system and to the POA as a whole. Anybody else? Yeah, I would like to say something. While there are a lot of people who like the trails, there are also a lot of members who do not like the trails. And everything year after year goes up in price. So while we can find someone who's willing to pay the maintenance for the next couple of years, I don't believe that that uh, 35,000 is gonna last very long, in my opinion. And um, what happens when that $35,000 is not enough is one question that I have. And then, um, you know, it's nice getting property given to us. However, with the ownership of property comes responsibility and expense. And I think over the next couple of years, yeah, we're going to have that. a lot of challenges that we're facing still with the stump dump fire. So, um, I, I'm, I am opposed to both of these. Sandy, well, at, what this, at this time, we're only talking about the, the two trails on the east side. Okay, well, uh, I'll uh, repeat myself then again later. Okay. What expense increase are you talking about? Current, like now? I'm I'm talking about in the future, Mary, okay. you can't add more trails without incurring additional expenses in the future. I understand that by the letter of the law, we're following the 2020 plan by not increasing our expenses today. But down the road, they will, ex they will increase. But we've made no commitment beyond three years. And I know, David, but what are we going to do when that 35000 is not enough? Are we just going to let the trails deteriorate? I'm just asking the question. Absolutely not. We will not let them deteriorate. We'll handle that when the time comes. We, we take one year at a time, and when three years is done, 
then we'll see what happens. Well, well I, I think I'd like to make two points. Um, a couple of comments that Joan has made is when a trail is being used at a very limited basis, it actually costs us more to maintain it. It's cheaper to maintain it when it's being used, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. Um, with regards to the uh, trails maintenance agreement uh, for each of the sections, we are obligated for $35,000. Uh, the city is also obligated for that same amount. Uh, our obligation does not exceed the $35,000. And Joan has found that as we have, as we've gone from, for, from 40 miles to 100 miles, there's definitely some synergy in that you're able to maintain more mileage for the same amount of money. So uh, while, Sandy, you are correct, I can't predict 10, 15 years into the future, um, but I can feel very comfortable uh, over the near term, over the next five to six, seven years, that we're gonna be comfortably, the $35,000 will take care of that. Uh, and finally, I said there was gonna be two points, I wanna make it, add a third one. Um, what Joan's also been doing is she's been going through and setting us up for the future. Uh, we, ten we tend to spend a little bit more in the first year and the second year of maintaining a trail system than afterwards because she's going through removing standing deads, getting them away from the trails and so forth. Um, so she's setting us up for the future. Um, so I, I think we're gonna be you know, I think we're going to be set for the, for the long haul. I also remember a comment that Joan made about the construction of the uh, many of the trails at this point. The trails are being built a little differently than uh, uh, the original back 40. Uh, they're being built to a different standard and they are more durable and uh, they're lasting longer. So uh, that's one thing that we might take into consideration that the newer trails are being built to require less maintenance. So are there any other comments? Yeah, I've just got one. First to start, I am for these two additions. I think they're improvements to areas that are already existing. I've looked at the maps, I've seen it does not encroach on homes. To me, the number one thing to always look at is the member, how does it affect anybody close or whatever's going on next to them. And I didn't see that that is going to affect anybody in these two um, improvements in these areas. I think everybody in this room and anybody watching knows I've been very vocal about trails in the past, not very fond of them encroaching on homes, not my home, not my friend's homes. I still don't want to see more trails being built we don't have, we're not talking about that right now. I just want to make it clear that the reason I support these, this is an improvement to what is already there to help it be maintained better, to help it get more usage and to make it better for that area. And that I just can't be against. Okay. I think Jerry wanted to say something. Jerry? Yeah, has, has anyone contacted the homeowners along that trail to see what kind of current impact it would have and when it becomes double the size of what it is currently and increases traffic, have those people been appraised of this? Question? Uh, no, we have not. Was that an answer? Uh, no, we have not contacted them. Okay. Jerry, I, I had asked I, that. I have to vote no on the project um, if we haven't contacted the folks let them know what may be happening and so on uh, we took an awful lot of heat on the, the uh, little sugar trails because people claimed they didn't know about it um, and to me the agreement is so faulty uh, there is so much left out of it that should be in it that I have to vote no, I'm sorry. Jerry, I had asked Aaron Rushing in one of our first meetings what the closest to any of the homes this these connectors would impact. And I believe he had said, you can correct me if you've had other conversations, 
that for specifically these few handful of homes on these connectors, I think it was less than five, it was even close to, um, nothing encroached closer than 60 yards. B before, we had always been talking 20, and that scared me. That's, that's a little close for comfort. I don't think there's anything closer than 60. So maybe the board wants to discuss later or now at what distance do we contact a homeowner? Because 60 yards to me feels like that's, that's appropriate to not have to contact. So keep in mind, most of these, well, all these areas are in valleys. Uh, so uh, they're way down. Uh, in most cases, they're 20, uh, 40 to 60 feet below elevation. If you noticed on the topographical map that, you know, they're not up on the top of the ridge where the homes are. Uh, the trails are down in into the valley. So you got to go over and look over the edge to see them. So. Okay, I'm going to ask for a vote. All those in favor of the suggested motion to the third amendment to the limited terminable licensing agreement signify by saying aye or raise your hand. Aye. One, two, three, four, five, six. Those opposed? One, two, three. Jerry Barron voted no. It passes. The next one up, the proposed transfer of the land to the POA. I need the motion first. Mary, would you read the motion? Sure. I move that we accept the transfer of land from Gordon Hollow Holding LLC, the Arkmo South parcel, and A and 12th Street LLC, the Huntley parcel, to the POA. Mm -hmm. With the understanding there will be no increase in cost to the POA for a period of at least three years. Tia. Second. Tia seconds that. Okay, discussion on this one. I've got a quick question. The you had sent me the parcel numbers mm -hmm. earlier today. One of them I looked up that was the ARCMO parcel. It was actually the parcel number for the whole 103 acres. Are they going to be changing something about that parcel? Because we're only talking about 33 of it. Yeah, they'll have to subdivide it. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I wasn't trying to. Yeah, it, it is for the entire parcel, or at least the Arkansas portion of it. You're correct. Uh, but they will divide it, and I assume they'll add, it, add an additional parcel number to it. Okay. So everything on the Arkansas side that was sold in ARCMO is included in this no okay so no so let's go back acres. okay so see how it's like a little l shaped here uh-huh okay so that is the entire arkansas portion of property that's all of that parcel that i showed you earlier today okay okay what they're going to grant us is the lower right hand corner Okay, so if we let's go back here, so it's going to be this low. See the red right here is where the trails are, and this is where the trails are. Does that make sense? So it's just the trail section of. It's just the trail section. If I were to, it's pretty much east of east of Gordon Hollow Road and in the floodplain there. Okay. Uh, at least most of it is. There's some that is above the floodplain. Is it connecting to other common property? The mm -hmm. port parcel that we would be getting is connected on the sides to common, not other Gordon well, Hollow property. East, on the east side it does. Okay. South. I'm gonna pull up Benton County GIS. It might be a little bit clearer to see. Okay. If anybody had, has used GIS, it's, it's a very useful tool. Yes. You can. You talking about me or the program? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's got to be one always. Is it easier to separate a parcel when Cooper's not involved? Because <laughs> I always thought parcel lines just from living in Bella Vista was like crazy hard to okay. change. All right. So here is all of the Arkansas portion of ARCMO this entire L shape, if you 
want to call it that. What they're talking about is it's basically this portion right here. Does that make sense? I can yep. get fancy and draw a line in there. Um, basically, it looks like approximately like that, approximately. So that gives you the, an idea. So that's 33 acres. Okay, so th th they had a lot more ins and outs on that, but it's basically following the line of the um, the trails. They, when they split that off, it'll have its own big long number down at the courthouse. Okay. How many acres was that? Now? 33. 33 acres. Point nine. At uh, uh, the Huntley one is. 33 but uh, it may turn out to be 29 uh, acres but they're both about the sim fairly similar size okay comments or questions I'll make a comment okay um, you know I I like the idea of POA owning the properties and so on, but I'm going to have to vote no on it simply because, especially on the Huntley property, don't know any of the specifics about are there any hazardous waste, is it floodplain, you know, anything about the property whatsoever. And based on the various lawsuit that the board should have known these things, and we don't know them, I'll have to vote no at this point in time. Anybody else? Um, I'll just repeat what I had said previously because I thought we were taking these together. But, um, you know, like I said, with ownership comes responsibility and expense. And the reason that I was asking earlier uh, in the email about how many miles of trails are on both of the Huntley and the Gordon Hollow properties is because we will eventually have to maintain those. And I just Thank think it would be really nice if we had an opportunity over these next three years or two, two, and a, two years and a few months to see how the trails wear the over 100 miles that we have now and to see where we stand financially. And I mean, I understand their desire to um, make this POA property because that's the only way to get water there, but I don't understand the reason why we have to acquire the, the property and the risk. So that's my comment. And, you know, that's why I oppose it at this time. I'm, I yeah, have an I, answer I, for that. I would say that we are responsible for maintaining those trails whether we own the property or not and the only way we are going to be able to generate revenue is through ownership so in my mind there is uh, no reason not to accept the gift of three hundred plus thousand dollar piece of property David, are, you know, uh, sorry, go ahead, Mike. Well, I was just going to say about the maintenance, like, like I appreciate the concern about the ma maintenance. <laughs> the 35,000 thing was a nominal buy -in from the city and the POA to accept the trails. You know, the, the amount of work, you know, to chop trees and do all this stuff, and it will pale in comparison to the amount of volunteer effort that is taken already happens every single day on the trails by your neighbors, people that you may not even know that you claim to like or whatever else out making Bella Vista beautiful and amazing and maintain those trails because they love and care about them. A myriad of examples you have 
Uh, Mike, you're breaking up. In the golf community over the years, the people taking it on their own time to do things with maintenance costs. Um, here's a on GIS, it has this helpful feature. So right here, you can see, oops, if I go right there, you'll see there's the parcel right there. And I've, what I've done is I've clicked on the FEMA 100-year flood zone, and you can see, so here is the flood zone. As you can see that, you know, this is Lake Windsor, the water that feeds into there. You can see that it's not marked in that parcel right there. It's pretty hilly right there. It doesn't flood. No, it does not flood. Not anywhere close. Okay. Do, do we know what their intention is things, with ARCMO? Things have been so broken up, we can't hardly hear any of the last things that either Mike or Tom said. Uh, Mike was breaking up real bad. We had a hard time hearing him here also. Sir, what did you say? If he couldn't hear you, do you want to? Talk about the flood oh, uh, so uh, what, Jerry, what I've done is I've pulled up on GIS. Here's the parcel right here. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. What I've done is I've clicked on uh, FEMA, uh, the hundred-year flood, and you can see that the it's the area is not marked by FEMA at all. Uh, but here's a, for example, here's what it would look like, uh, the area that feeds into Lake Windsor. You can see that's flood zone. Uh, we've commented. Uh, T, I think you were about to talk, ask about um, ARCMO, and you'll see that a large portion of that ARCMO South is in the flood zone of the section that we're looking at. Pretty much all of it. Other than this bottom section here, right here. Yeah. Okay, did that answer your question? Do we know what they're going to do with the rest of the sections of ARCMO that are going to connect to what they're gifting us? No. That's a great question. I have not received an answer to that question. Um, I think they're still coming up with ideas. So they're giving us the floodplain part. <laughs> well. Yeah. Well, um, I, I had one more question. Um, David, you indicated that we're responsible for the maintenance of the Huntley and the Gordon Hollow anyway. Correct. Um, I don't think I understand that. Are you saying that those parcels are already in our license agreement? No, no, just the trails. Just the Not trails. Not the parcels, just the trails. The trails are our responsibility. Have we signed an agreement that says any trails in the entire city that we'll be responsible for? I thought that the other license agreements listed particular parcels. Right. So we, we do have a trails maintenance agreement for the little sugar section and uh, those trails are included. Do we have any other parcels uh, where the trails are at that are not BOA or city owned? Uh, as I indicated earlier, 98% of the trails, 98% of the 100 miles are common property. Uh, you have these two sections here. Uh, you have a, uh, a small amount uh, with um, uh, that is on city property. Anything else that they have, um, they have easements in place. But uh, you know, ninety-eight percent is common property. Okay, I'm going to call for the vote then. All in favor of accepting the transfer of these two pieces of property signify by saying aye or raising your hand. Aye. That's seven. Opposed? Jerry and Sandy. Seven to two. That brings us to the end of our published agenda. I don't believe there's anything else at this time. So I will read the announcements. The board candidate informational meeting is Wednesday, January 6th at 4 p.m. here in the boardroom. It's available also via Zoom. Any candidates for the board who have completed the packet or if considering completing the packet uh, can be informed, uh, get, ask questions on what's involved. The Recreation Committee will meet Monday, January 11th at 4 p.m. 
Zoom and Facebook live stream only. Golf committee, Wednesday, January 13th, 8.30 a.m. in the boardroom at the country club and Zoom. The lakes committee is Wednesday, January 13th, 2 p.m. in the boardroom in the country club and Zoom. Board of Directors GM meeting is Thursday, January 14th, 4 p.m. in the boardroom at the Country Club and Zoom. This is a closed meeting. Board of Directors work session Thursday, January 21st, 9 a.m. in the boardroom in the Country Club and Zoom. And the January regular monthly meeting and the board <coughs> candidate lottery drawing, the announcement of the candidates for next year's election. Thursday, January 28th, 6 p.m. here in the boardroom at the Country Club and also via Zoom. Thank you for attending. Have a Merry Christmas. Please stay safe. Merry Christmas.